Hello everyone and welcome back to Computer Vision Lecture Series. This is Lecture 9, Part 2. In this lecture, we are going to talk more about correspondence problems. In the last part of this uh, lecture, we saw the problem of uh, having smaller baselines in comparison to having larger baselines. Um, on the left hand side of this slide, you can see the same problem being uh, recreated here. Um, the problem with uh, small, having smaller baseline is that we would have a larger depth of uh, uncertainty and because of this we would not be able to localize the correspondence properly and uh, uh, this would uh, fail in locating the depth of the 3D object. However, uh, by increasing the uh, length of the baseline we can reduce this uh, uh, depth of uncertainty and um, uh, try to solve the problem. However, the uncertainty in the co point correspondences will increase because the images will have larger differences between them. And this problem, uh, so there has to be a compromise between uh, a small baseline and a larger baseline. And we saw that vergence is one solution to this. By uh, rotating the angra, uh, rotating the camera centers inwards, we increase the field of view of our stereo and essentially reduce the depth of uh, uncertainty as well as the correspondences are uh, reduced. Um, so if you have seen this areas getting smaller in this vergence, this is what we want to do at the end. But we achieve this by uh, rotating the uh, camera centers towards one another and this will uh, disrupt our uh, binocular setup where we had made certain assumptions for calculating the triangulation and finding the cor point correspondences using uh, stereo and epipolar constraints. Uh, so if we uh, turn the cameras towards one another, their uh, optical axis no longer are parallel, near, neither are the image planes in the same uh, plane. And because of this, uh, however, Virgins provides us a solution it does not, it, it presents us with another problems like solving uh, a more complex geometry. So what is, um, so if uh, we don't have to be worried about more complex geometry, there are ways of rectifying that and that method or the task of rectification of such complex situation is called stereo image rectification. What is done here essentially is we assume that no two images or no two cameras can have consistency or have parallel optical axis, similar image planes. So we let go of this uh, assumptions and therefore we have to also let go of our scan line coherence um, assumption, assumptions as well. So uh, how to solve this problem? One way is that um, um, that uh, so um, we will look at uh, what is the way but usually this is the how uh, the 3d scene is imaged via two cameras so this is the image plane on the left when viewed from the left hand side and this is the image plane on the right when viewed on the right hand side and this point on the uh, 3d in, in the in the 3d world is recreated in these two different planes in these two different locations and uh, uh, because these uh, cameras are uh, or these camera centers or these eye centers in this case are not uh, do not have their optical axis parallel their axis would intersect in the real world so these are very common cameras which are called worst cameras or everyday cameras if you want to call them and can we use the question is now we already know our binocular stereo setup so can we reformulate this problem into the previous problem in such a way that we can use the previously established techniques and this is a very common practice in computer vision in many as in many other field that you reformulate or repurpose certain things in such a way that you can reuse the previously well established methods to solve a newer problem so what do we do here in a stereo image rectification there is a simple trick um, this image the one on the left hand side, the gray image, is uh, we do a projective mapping in such a way that it be, it falls into a certain plane. Okay, and this projective mapping in, is easy because we know the camera characteristics, we know the location. So it's a, just a matter of uh, transformation using a homography matrix. It's a simple homographic transformation. 
So we do uh, a trans projective mapping of uh, the image plane into another image plane. And this creates a warping of the image. We will see later uh, some with some example what it means. And uh, however, while doing this projective mapping, the one assumption that we make that our camera position does not change. So we have to choose an image plane in such a way that um, it suits our purpose. We will get to that later as well. Essentially, uh, in an example, in a 2D example, what we are doing here is, let's say you have, this is our, your camera center on the left, and this is the um, uh, visual or the stereo visual field. And this is the original image plane that you are from, which is, uh, which, is, which is warped. This blue one is the original image plane. And the orange one is the warped image plane that is formed. Here you can see that our camera center does not change, and that is our assumption. So a new image that is formed will be a bit warped version of the original image plane. So what are the steps involved in rectification? We have these two image plane uh, taken from two different angles in a different um, uh, without a binocular stereo setup. And uh, we define a new image plane or a new plane such that uh, we do a projective mapping of both of our images onto this common image plane and if we do that then we have essentially set up a virtual or a, a pseudo camera system where the image planes are now in the same image plane and their uh, new uh, optical axis or virtual, virtual optical axis will be parallel and now we have reformulated our new problem of stereo image um, uh, of, of, of the real world problem into our binocular stereo image setup right and because of doing this uh, the images will be warped but we will have a uh, better correspondences we can use the same scan line uh, epipolar constraints and uh, triangulate positions to find the correspondences between the two images uh, we will see how to do that but it is very simple to see that it's a simple trick that we did was to reformulate our uh, problem into our previous binocular stereo setup, which is a very common uh, practice. Okay, so this is an example. Here we see on the top, uh, left hand side, on the right hand side, two stereo image pairs. Sorry, a stereo image pair uh, where um, we can see that uh, they are not taken from uh, with the with the uh, the camera centers are not uh, optically parallel. And what we do is we warp them or do a projective transformation, uh, what basically is called rectification, such that uh, the image planes are now uh, common for both these warped images. Now you can see what we mean by warping. So if we do a projective transformation of these images onto a common image plane, the images will be uh, bent or um, moved or stretched in such a way that uh, its original view uh, changes a little. However, we achieve some important things here. Because we have reformulated it with our uh, mapping to a previous binocular stereo setup, now we can just look at the st uh, sc same scan line in both the images to find the point correspondences. And by doing that, we can easily find the disparities. Remember, when you find the disparities between these two images, it is in the new virtual binocular stereo setup. You have to uh, remap or pro re, um, back project these disparity maps to, uh, to recover the original disparity for the original images. So by, um, by doing this uh, mapping, we, have, uh, find, we are able to use our previous method and find all the point correspondences for both the images on the same scanned line, which is a great thing. So what is the correspondence problem here? Uh, the assumptions that we have made until now was uh, that uh, for both the views of both the images that we get from the two different cameras, uh, most of the points are visible. And there are some regions in, in addition to the views uh, that are very similar and can be tracked from one image to the other one. And this is very important part of our assumption because the correspondence cannot be solved if you cannot see the same feature in the other image. 
and uh, correspondence is essentially a naive search problem by picking up one pixel from one image you just do a random search if you go the na most naive approach would be to uh, just compare that image pixel value to every other pixel value on the next image or the next frame to find the correspondence however because we only have 256 color channels it is not always um, efficient to do that and you will also always find more than a few hundred matches for this common intensity value so um, after uh, apart from this naive uh, search problem uh, what are the three underlying questions that we need to ask when we are trying to solve the correspondence problem one is that how do we match or what do we match between these two images do we match every pixel do we match every edge do we match every object uh, is it a set of pixels? Is it a contour? What What is it? So this question has to be answered if you, before you attack your problem uh, for correspondence for any given setting. And what kind of similarity are you using? So if, when you're comparing the pixel values, you're using a mean squared error? Are you using an absolute var value? Are you using, and if you're using a set of pixels, are you using some form of uh, correlation? Are you using some form of um, neighborhood or a windowed approach? What are you using? So that similarity uh, measure has to be defined. And then can, uh, the third question is to ask is can we search in a systematic way? This is important because in order to have a full uh, search in a proper way, can you uh, prepare a system or an algorithm that can do it more efficiently to save computations and still achieve you the same results uh, as you would have uh, achieved without using the algorithm, but in a faster way. But we have solved this kind of problems or we have seen these kind of problems before in optical flow estimation specifically uh, finding this windowed region or finding the similarity metrics even for feature matching and feature extraction and feature tracking in the earlier lectures we have seen this kind of problems uh, as well so you have seen until now in computer vision uh, a lot of things are being solved by using uh, a lot of predefined methods in the past and a lot of pro a lot of problems are being reformulated into uh, previously established computational methods and then we try to solve them so something similar we are going to do for the correspondence problem as well okay so what is point correspondence point correspondence essentially means that we match each and every pixel value or every pixel location in the in one image to the next image so we find this disparity map or the depth um, they can be used interchangeably by the way for each and every pixel values and this was a, po a popular problem by um, presented by uh, Jules is that it had um, uh, where he gave these two different images which are very random which do not have any uh, recognizable content so essentially it is not a recognition problem that is what Jules wanted to prove however when you look at these two images so uh, maybe in the slides it's not so clear but uh, you can do a random uh, you can do a google image search for uh, random dot stereograms where you will find such pairs of images uh, what these pairs of images are about is there are there are certain re regions of the image for example this region is repeated here so there are certain regions of uh, both these images which are common so at pixel level and some, there are some groupings of uh, pixel which are also similar and if you have these two images in front of you and you uh, spend some time looking at both the images simultaneously um, because there is a small disparity you will start to perceive depth inside these images it is amazing uh, the problem is not everybody is able to do this so there is a cognitive process involved uh, we don't know the answer why everybody cannot do it but if you are able to do it then you will realize that recognition is not a necessary condition for solving point correspondences that is the idea of this experiment so even if you have two different images which are which look like essentially noises noised images but even if you can compare certain regions of both the images and find some correspondences you start perceiving depth so in order to solve disparity or depth you don't really need to solve recognition that is the purpose of this uh, this experiment 
So how do we do point correspondence in practice? Let us see with an example. Here is a Lincoln on left and right hand side of the image and he is separated by a little stereo. Uh, there is a stereo, the, the, these two, there are, these are two stereo pairs. Okay. So the first step is to plot a scan line and um, which we call epipolar line because uh, we have uh, assumed binocular stereo setup here. So every pixel on the left hand side of the image we look at all this all the uh, pixels in, on the same uh, scan line or the epipolar line to find a match for this point. However, as you can see this point which is lying on the uh, on the coat of Lincoln in the left hand side of the image could very well match to any of the points on this coat in on the right hand side of the image. So it's not a very uh, efficient um, correspondence and it is not easy to solve this power correspondence problem on a pixel level. So um, more general we need to find a more like um, a group of pixels or a neighborhood where this where they match quite well. For example in these two windows you will see that there is a huge uh, intensity change. So we need to find such windows which have uh, which overlap in both the images to find this correspondence for a particular pixel value. We can define these windows around the pixels in such a way that it is related to the pixel in some way to find the uh, proper disparity value for that pixel value for that pixel sorry. So uh, even when we define such windows we are still left with one important question how do we compare what is the similarity or metric or what is the comparison metric that we will use. So we compare uh, regions around the points uh, we take their intensity profiles we can define a window we can define a set of pixels uh, it could be anything depending on the problem it could be uh, a square rectangle circle it could be anything. And then when we match these uh, elements in these two images by fixing this uh, window size we have we evaluate their uh, similarity using a similarity matrix and then see uh, which is the which has the minimum cost and the window which gives us the minimum cost is essentially our target correspondence. Uh, we have already seen some similarity metrics to compare two different image patches. Uh, one was the in, in the beginning in the la last uh, lecture even last, last few lectures we have seen sum of square distances which is essentially taking each uh, pixel value in both of these windows and uh, taking the different sum of uh, some of their square differences um, but we saw that if the intensity values are if they are too high or if they are taken with the different exposure or if there are occlusions sum of square distances will um, the error generated by those pixel values will dominate the sum of square distances and therefore in order to avoid that we uh, proposed uh, a correlation between these two windows. Now correlation is a better measure because it only matches uh, the uh, it ma because it matches the window in its entirety so it's more of a like a global uh, operation in that window. And normalized correlation is an uh, obvious um, extension to the correlation in such a way that uh, even if you have different exposures uh, you keep your uh, pixel range values in a common uh, you, you basically remap your pixel values of your windows into a common range so that uh, even if they have been taken at different exposures they will give you the um, proper correlation matrix. Okay, but for each window here uh, we have assumed that uh, it's a binocular stereo setup so you have to find these windows along only the stereo lines uh, or the um, uh, sorry the scan lines or the epipolar lines in the other image. So it's not a very big uh, exhaustive search it's only along the scan line so it is a bit better. So uh, correspondence search with similarity constraint here is an example uh, we see uh, one scan line across a uh, left and right images and we start we fix uh, a window here that we want to map match in the right hand side of the image. We start with these blue squares and we go along and we plot its corresponding matching cost or uh, its disparity along the 
uh, along the we create a graph um, of uh, the disparity uh, across matching cost okay so when we calculate this we find that the, uh, the profile looks something like this and matching cost could be anything matching cost could be a sum of square distances or it could be a normalized uh, correlation the important thing to remember is for matching cost it has to be uh, so what you're trying to look at if it is an error metric in the matching cost it has to be a minimum uh, value if you're doing a correlation then you are essentially trying to find a maximum uh, overlap in that case it will be higher for example if you are using a sum of square distances uh, the point where you match the value will have the lowest value um, so this window if you match it on the right hand side of the image that location will have the lowest sum of square distance values and this is what we are looking for however if you are using a normalized correlation in that case uh, the graph or the correlation will be very high at the point where you match uh, the window in both the images so a uh, correspondence search with a similarity uh, constraint can be done in this manner. Okay, so uh, even if we have, uh, this is another example where we see this um, um, two different images where, it, uh, the, where the vanishing lines are going uh, parallel into the image. So uh, here we, if you, if you want to find the correspondences, you, we plot along the scan lines here. And we uh, find and we plot the intensity value across values across these scan lines and these scan lines are chosen uh, randomly for um, it could be anywhere in the image but we are giving an example here so we chose it here and we plot their intensity profiles and visually it is quite clear to see that the, the, the these intensity pro profiles are quite similar however due to noise and due to uh, but it is clear to see that there is some disparity or some movement in the left hand side and the right hand side of the image because uh, in the beginning of the curves there is an additional um, intensity value on the left hand side of the image and because of this um, uh, computers are not e uh, able to easily compute the correspondences here because of the noise and there, there is a bit of ambiguity and it's not easy to match these squ uh, scan lines um properly okay so we have seen what is the correspondence problem now and now uh, in the next part of the uh, of this lecture we will see how we can solve this uh, scan line problem and we will also see how windows windowed approach taken to correspondence um, problem solving can have uh, problems as well as so there is also some problems even if we choose the windowed approach and how to solve those windowed approach uh, how to solve those problems uh, presented by the windowed approach uh, we are going to see it in the next part of the lecture until then thank you